Welcome to Key Insights from Day 2 of Lymphoma and Myeloma 2016 here at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. I'm Dr. Morton Coleman, Director of the Center for Lymphoma and Myeloma, and with me today is Dr. Richard Furman, who is the head of the CLL section um, at New York Weill Cornell Medical Center. Uh, Rick, welcome. Thank you. Today was a very exciting day in terms of new developments in chronic lymphatic leukemia. It seems to be as though there's one new item coming along almost on a monthly basis. I think at today's conference, uh, I was impressed by the seminal role those patients uh, who have CLL and for a long time seem to develop the P53 abnormality. Uh, what is your take on P53 and its role in CLL, both in terms of prognosis as well as response and what type of therapy should be directed at it? Well, I really think that, you know, as we've gotten this new influx of therapies or this influx of new therapies for CLL, you know, it really has changed our approach to how we prognosticate patients. And I think most of the prognostic markers really have lost their meaning. The, you know, the important prognostic markers, the one that really are going to impact upon and change patient outcome are the ones that are going to either increase the risk of developing progressive disease on a, you know, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor or the development of a Richter's transformation, which tend not to be responsive to our tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So P53 really does play an important role in that because when you look at the patients on irutinib as first-line therapy or in the relapse refractory setting, you know, if they're not 17P deleted or 11Q deleted, they will enjoy a very long response and potentially even indefinite response. So, you know, the 17P deletion really becomes, I think, one of the more important things that we use to identify who are our patients that need additional help. One of the important developments, I believe, is the advent of venetoclax, which works through the inhibition of BCL2 and a, P a P53 independent process, really enables us to actually have two agents now that can attack um, CLL that is 17P deleted and do it in a much more rapid manner. And I think the two together, which are currently being investigated in a number of studies, really may allow us to achieve these very, very deep remissions that could really prevent people from going on and developing resistance and subsequent Richter's transformation. In light of the development of these new drugs which we now have available to us, the singling inhibitors and the BCL2 inhibitors, do you see any role for chemotherapy? I do not. You know, the thing that I think is really quite important to keep in mind is the non-17P and non-11Q deleted patients really do extremely well on the BCR antagonists. And when you treat them with that, that really may be, you know, the data suggests the only therapy that they need. If you're thinking about a more aggressive case, then of course chemotherapy also loses its benefit. And I think we have sufficient data now available to us really indicating that even in these poor risk patients, the BCR antagonists are going to fare better than the chemotherapy. And we'll have five-year data um, made public at ASH this year on ibrutinib in uh, treatment naive and relapse refractory CLL. Do you think chemotherapy has a role in terms of creating a more profound response and uh, perhaps a more profound minimal residual disease or minimal measurable disease, if you would? Um, do you think there's still a role for chemotherapy in that regard? And also, what about the young, fit patient who can take FCR therapy who will perhaps have a very good uh, MRD, M, uh, MRD response uh, and then not need therapy as opposed to having to stay on the singling inhibitors, for instance, on an indefinite basis? What do you say in response to those patients who said, I'll just take chemotherapy for six months and call it a day? So to answer the first question, I think one of the important, I mean, I think that's a very important idea because of these patients who do develop progressive disease on ibrutinib, namely the 17P deleted, 11Q deleted patients. And the idea that if we were to generate very rapid, deep responses, maybe we can have basically our therapies knock out the clone before resistance develops. So I do think there's a role for a deeper remission. I think the 
use of venetoclax offers many, many advantages over chemotherapy in that space, um, and for a number of reasons. Most importantly, the you know role of chemotherapy seems to be very much so in increasing the risk of having these secondary mutations just through their genotoxic effects, and so I really think avoiding them become very, very important. We also have from the Helios data um, an interesting idea where, you know, when you look at ibrutinib plus bendamustine rituxan, you know, that curve, and I'm, of course, comparing two phase two studies, you know, the ibrutinib alone curve looks identical to the bendamustine rituxan plus ibrutinib curve. So all of a sudden, you know, what additional benefit is added by chemotherapy is really unclear. As Dr. Chesson said, that the Helio study was designed incorrectly. They did BR plus abrutinib versus BR. It should have been BR plus abrutinib versus abrutinib alone, from what you're saying, and I certainly agree with that hypothesis. Uh, so what do you say to the young man who says, I'll take six months of chemo, and if I get a great response, I won't need to take any more treatment? Well, I actually suggest he see another oncologist. Uh -huh. I wouldn't treat that patient. And of course, I think it's important to, above all else, do no harm. There is a significant risk of MDS and AML in our patients who receive FCR. And while that risk is anywhere reported anywhere from 4 to 10 percent of patients, the big issue really becomes, I think, that now that we have all these new therapies for CLL patients, and the ostensibly the potential for a CLL patient, even a young one with CLL, to have a normal life expectancy. You know, we don't know what FCR six cycles of FCR chemotherapy to a 50-year-old is going to do to their bone marrow, so that when they're 70-year-olds, whether or not they'll have functioning bone marrow. And I hate to, you know, knowingly cause what really would be, you know, such a depleting therapy, and even seeing MDS risks not the seven to 10 years post chemotherapy that we typically report with chemotherapy induced MDS AML, but really much further down the line. When we do see you know, MDS AML in patients even without prior chemotherapy. Well, in Hodgkin's disease, most of your hematologic malignancies that are going to occur are MDS usually within the first seven years you see solid tumors thereafter, and that may also apply to FCR. But I but do think that an important catch is, or caveat, is going to be, you know, the, really the purine analog and alkylator really seems to be much more toxic in terms of risk of MDS than most of the other therapies we have used. Mm -hmm. So I do worry that we're going to very much see a marked increase down the road. So now let's still talk about combination therapy. From your presentation, I gather that a brutinib gives you a very, very rapid lymph node response, but it's a little slower in clearing the bone marrow and the peripheral blood, whereas venetoclax does just the opposite. Do you see a role for combining these two agents down, down the future pike? So I really have to emphasize that in the patients who have good prognostics, so they're not, and let me rephrase that, good prognostics in 2016, to me, mean that they're not 17p deleted, not 11q deleted, and not notch one mutated. You know, if they have anything but one of those three, they can really expect to have a very excellent response and a long duration of response to ibrutinib alone. So those patients don't need anything else. For those patients who do have one of those mutations or deletions that set them up for having subsequently bad outcomes, those people, I can at least theoretically believe, could derive benefit from a more rapid response. And so in those patients, I do think combination therapy will be key. Do you think combination therapy holds the, the key to cure? Would it, when instead of just thinking in terms of maintaining the patient, do you think there's the possibility of combining these two agents, or maybe even a third agent, might lead us to cure chronic lymphatic leukemia? I do believe that, you know, I don't believe combination therapy is necessary, once again, for those patients who don't have 17P deletion, 11Q deletion, or notch one, because, you know, over time we are seeing the number of CRs rise with ibrutinib use, and we are, I believe, eventually going to get down to MRD negativity in our patients. So I think that, you know, progression-free survival is the single most important measure of outcome for our patients. And it doesn't matter if it takes seven years or, you know, 10 years. If you 
remain free of progression and you get to that MRD negative state, you know, that's really all that matters. And so I think that, you know, it's only those patients who aren't going to be able to enjoy that eventuality that we have to worry about. Speaking in terms of MRD negativity, it depends on what technique you're using. Would you care to give us some commentary on what Dr. Hillman had to say in terms of techniques of determining MRD? Should this be part now of the average practitioner's uh, practice uh, in terms of determining how, how long or how much treatment to give the patient? So right now it should not be. We definitely have no data regarding the use of MRD to guide therapy. We have done some pr um, studies in the past where we've used the add-on of additional agents such as alemtuzumab to chemotherapy to try to knock out residual disease. And that, of course, is a totally separate scenario in that outside of that scenario, we really have no role for measuring MRD. Now, I do believe that MRD may play a role down the line when we start entertaining the idea of discontinuation of therapy. And of course, there identifying how much MRD is sufficient is going to become very important. It's very important to recognize that you know, MRD negativity with venetoclax, which works very quickly and very abruptly and ostensibly achieves an MRD immediately, relatively speaking, is you know, being below 10 to the minus fourth, which is the current clinically available MRD uh, limit, is very different than what you might see with ibrutinib, where a patient gradually reaches their MRD status. So if someone becomes 10 to the minus two, then 10 to the minus three, then 10 to the minus four, then 10 to the minus five, they may relapse if you were to stop therapy. And that's a very different scenario than with venetoclax, where we expect people to go from you know, 10 to the 10 down to 10 to the minus whatever. And so I think it will be important to improve our MRD assessments with the use of ibrutinib so we really can help determine when is it best to stop the therapy. And of course, we also need the data that stopping the therapy isn't going to allow the patient, isn't going to cause the patients to be set up for something worse. Would you like to comment on some of the newer agents coming down the pike right now? We've certainly made major progress with ibrutinib and venetoclax. Uh, but would you care to tell us a little bit about some of the newer ones that uh, are being tested right now and the advantages and disadvantages? Well, I really think right now we're going to have a, a group of new agents that are second generation PI3 kinase inhibitors, second generation BTK inhibitors. And I think that the likelihood is that they may or may not add more to our current level of effectiveness. I think we have good data supporting a calibrutinib having some benefits over ibrutinib in terms of adverse events, but not in terms of efficacy. I think that there'll be some other therapies that will be, that were not spoken about today that will be coming, that will be becoming important like a ROR1 directed antibody, which seems to actually work as a signal inhibitor, a signal transduction inhibitor more than it does an antibody. And all of these things will make our therapies just more effective. I think, you know, we're in a fortunately, um, we have such an array of riches that I really do believe in being very, you know, risk adverse. And that's why I really believe avoiding chemotherapy is just so important. Would you care to comment on sick inhibitors and also on the newer PI3 kinase inhibitors that may not have as much off-target effect or toxicity is whatever you want to call it. So I think the sick inhibitors have by and large shown really mediocre success and so I'm still not impressed with their use in hematologic malignancies. They certainly are better tolerated and I think they might have a role in autoimmune diseases or other diseases that um, are, are more benign in their outcomes. But I think that right now um, you know, BTK inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors are going to be far more effective. With regard to the other PI3 kinase inhibitors that are being developed, I think that by and large they're all going to be very much the same. And it remains to be seen, um, you know, whether or not there is a clinical difference. Now I do believe that, you know, we are learning a tremendous amount about the PI3 kinase inhibitors and their adverse events. And I think that, you know, we have learned how to take care, how to use them safely and effectively. So I think that, you know, they do 
represent a significant um, agent to use in our patients who wouldn't be able to tolerate a BTK inhibitor or venetoclax. So it's nice to have additional agents with which to use. I know we're very enthusiastic about these new agents, but uh, brutinib now has been on the market for a while, and we're encountering, I think, a little bit more toxicity than we anticipated. Would you like to comment on the ability to be maintained on a brutinib for many patients who encounter some toxicities which interfere with their quality of life? I do think that we that the toxicities and the basically the ability to maintain a patient on therapy is very user dependent. And I find and what we have found is that the more experienced physicians do they're much more able to help the patients manage the adverse events and actually stay on ibrutinib. And I think that as physicians get more and more experience with ibrutinib, they will recognize certain tricks that will help them. Um, help their patients stay on therapy, which of course is the most important thing because of course if you don't take the therapy You're not going to derive its benefit So the best example is you know the recognition that if you take the ibrutinib at bedtime Instead of in the morning and don't eat after you obviously don't eat after you go to bed, which we all know we shouldn't You actually uh, have a far less risk of diarrhea and the diarrhea that does occur is actually far less severe so it's really a way to make things much more um, tolerable and um, you know sort of increases the, the likelihood of a patient will be able to receive therapy. In terms of toxicities, uh, how do you manage those patients who have to be on anticoagulation or some form of, of interference with hemostasis? The patient has to be on Coumadin or aspirin and so forth. We do know that there is a hemostatic defect with the brutinib. How, how do you advise your patients who are on various forms of anticoagulation? So, you know, ibrutinib's impact on platelets is very much akin to an aspirin-like effect on platelets. And so I think it's, you know, important to keep that in mind. So, you know, the cardiologists are very aggressive in having patients on antiplatelet agents, and, you know, they sometimes have both anticoagulant and antiplatelet uh, agents simultaneously. We did see some complications with Coumadin in and ibrutinib use concurrently. And so, by and large, if I have to anticoagulate a patient, I do, preserve, I do prefer the, nor, the novel oral anticoagulants. But I think nowadays um, we have enough other options that I'm first going to go to venetoclax in a patient who requires anticoagulation or obinutuzumab or idelalisib. So I think we have enough other agents that it's rare that I'll be in a position where I feel like I'll have to use the ibrutinib. Well, speaking about monoclonal antibodies, obinutuzumab is considered and at this time, quotes, to be superior to rituximab. And in the German study, looking at the two antibodies along with chlorambucil, uh, it was clear that obinutuzumab had a greater progression-free survival uh, uh, than did rituximab. Uh, however, they used an enormous amount of protein, uh, of antibody, up front in the obinutuzumab arm as opposed to the rituximab arm. And we do know that if you increase the dose of rituximab, your response rate in chronic lymphatic leukemia goes up. Uh, do you think that obinutuzumab is a superior agent? We know that, uh, that so it supposedly uh, works better. I absolutely believe that obinutuzumab is a far superior agent to rituximab. And while there was an increase amount of antibody use with abinutuzumab, it really was not much greater than what is used in CLL, than what rituximab is used in CLL. And so the relative amount of antibody that's used is different. The increased doses of rituximab that have shown improved efficacy are actually far, far greater than the doses of abinutuzumab. And the response rates, even using these extremely high doses, never approach those of abinutuzumab. And in my own hands, I believe that abinutuzumab itself is far more effective than rituximab. Well, thank you very much for your insights, uh, Dr. Furman. This is uh, Dr. Morton Coleman wishing you a good day. Thank you.